After watching video 4, we now have a good sense of what neurons are and how they function and communicate with one another. Now let's take a look at some techniques that are common in two subfields of neuroscience, neurophysiology and neuroanatomy. And they play a large part in how we study circadian rhythms throughout the brain and body of an organism. To do that, I'm going to show you excerpts from films developed by Jove, an online science video journal, which creates videos related to science methods and techniques for educational purposes. Now, while this is not a comprehensive list of all the techniques you'll encounter throughout the course, this should provide a good background and get you comfortable with some of the ways this research can be conducted. Since you've just learned about action potentials, we'll start with techniques in neurophysiology that we can use to measure and visualize neuronal activation in various ways, including patch clamping, calcium imaging, multi-electrode arrays, optogenetics, and EEG. The field of neurophysiology provides insight into how the nervous system works and how its dysfunction can lead to disease. Physiology is the study of how organisms and their parts function. Neurophysiology can be defined as the study of the functioning of the nervous system, which includes the brain, the spinal cord, peripheral nerves, and sensory organs. Neurophysiologists approach the nervous system in multiple levels of organization that include functional systems, circuits, single neurons, and neuronal compartments. As you can see, a neurophysiologist can tackle a range of scientific questions from single molecules and neurons to widespread activity in the brain. Now that you have a feel for some of the key questions asked by neurophysiologists, let's look at some of the prominent methods used to answer them. Patch clamping is one of the most widely used techniques for investigating neurons at the cell and molecular level. Using a little bit of suction, a fine glass capillary electrode is sealed onto the neuron, allowing for internal monitoring of whole cell excitability. There are also patch clamp configurations where a small patch of membrane is excised from the cell, thereby providing access to the cytoplasmic side of the plasma membrane for pharmacological manipulation. Calcium imaging can be used to investigate excitation over the entire neuron. Neurons are loaded with a dye that changes its fluorescence in response to an elevated calcium concentration within the cell. While intracellular calcium has many functions, calcium imaging can be used as an indirect measure of action potentials, as shown with this example neuron. Techniques used to study neural circuits need to be able to monitor many neurons at once. The use of multi-electrode arrays with many contacts is one method used to record from multiple neurons simultaneously. Neural circuitry can also be investigated using optogenetics in which neurons are modified to express light-sensitive ion channels. When exposed to light, these channels open and, depending on their ion selectivity, they can either inhibit or excite the neuron, which provides insight into what role that neuron plays in a particular circuit and the behavioral response governed by that circuit. To visualize patterns of activity on a broader scale, a variety of techniques are used. Electroencephalography, or EEG, uses electrodes on the skull to monitor electrical activity across the entire brain. Thanks for watching. For the most part, as circadian biologists, we study the neurons in the SCN, which is a structure above the optic chiasm in the hypothalamus. Here I'll show you a video illustrating one of the most common views we use to look at neurons in the hypothalamus and SCN, called a coronal slice. Here the brain is being sectioned into extremely thin coronal slices so that we can see what's going on inside. This is one slice of the brain that gives a good view of the hypothalamus. Throughout this class, you'll see images that look like this. And this is where we will find the SCN.
Now we know how to section the brain to find the SCN. Throughout the course, you will see images from circadian research generated by using some of these neurophysiological techniques that you just learned about. For example, researchers have used multi-electrode arrays to record changes in the firing pattern of SCN neurons in response to light history. Calcium imaging was used to discover light-sensitive retinal cells that we now know are essential for circadian function. Here they show response to light exposure of different lengths. These researchers used optogenetics to stimulate SCN neurons in live animals and reset their circadian clock. And in addition to the uses for EEG you saw in the film, EEG is often used to measure sleep quantity and quality in circadian studies. Now we'll look at some techniques we can use for visualizing structures in the nervous system, including histology and tracers, microscopy and fluorescence imaging, MRI, and lesions. Through the study of neuroanatomy, scientists attempt to draw a map to navigate the complex system that controls our behavior. On the microscopic level, neuroanatomists investigate the relationships between signaling cells, known as neurons, maintenance cells, known as glia, and the extracellular matrix structure that support them. From a broader view at the organ level, neuroanatomy examines brain structures and nerve pathways. This video will provide an overview of neuroanatomical research. Today's neuroanatomists ask questions concerning how structure relates to function. To begin, some researchers focus specifically on cytoarchitecture or the arrangement of neurons and glia. For example, to investigate specific nuclei or neuron clusters in the brain, it is helpful to characterize the neuronal subtypes found there and the connections those cells make with other brain regions. Given that cytoarchitecture is dynamic, another key question in this field focuses on how and why neuroanatomical changes take place. For example, learning and memory are associated with neuroplasticity, or changes in neural pathways, like alterations in the structural contact points between neurons. Small protrusions, called dendritic spines, can dynamically change in size, shape, and number in an activity-dependent manner. Understanding the structure of the nervous system is also pivotal to explaining its dysfunction. For instance, debilitating neurodegenerative diseases are associated with Having discussed the key questions that neuroanatomical diseases are associated with characteristic neuroanatomical changes, such as the degeneration of dopaminergic neurons observed in Parkinson's disease. Having discussed the key questions that neuroanatomists ask, let's review the tools these scientists use to find answers. First, histology, or the analysis of stained tissue slices, is an essential technique for studying cytoarchitecture. Neuroanatomists have a number of stains at their disposal to visualize specific structures in the nervous system. Histochemistry is a branch of histology based on the localization and identification of chemical components. One particularly valuable application of histochemistry is the detection of tracers, molecules that are introduced into neurons to visualize their connections within the nervous system. As we mentioned previously, the advent of the microscope revolutionized the way that neuroanatomy was studied. The light microscope enables histologically stained neuronal tissue to be imaged at up to a thousand times its original size, thereby revealing cytoarchitecture. 
The fluorescence light microscope allows for immunolabeled proteins to be imaged in tissue sections or in culture and permits co-localization studies, which involve determining whether or not two proteins are in close proximity within a single neuron. Confocal imaging is an improved method of fluorescence microscopy that permits the optical sectioning of neuronal tissue and can therefore be used to generate 3D reconstructions of neurons so their morphology or shape can be studied. Two-photon imaging is another type of fluorescence imaging which can penetrate deeply into tissue and is often used for live imaging of the brain in behaving animals. However, no photon can penetrate quite like an electron, so electron microscopy has been invaluable for providing sub-nanometer resolution of neuronal structures. In particular, the synapse has been visualized in exquisite detail using transmission electron microscopy. Furthermore, by compiling the images obtained from serial sections visualized with electron microscopy, 3D constructions of neuronal volumes can be generated via a process known as tomography. To monitor changes in neuroanatomical structures over time, neuroimaging is an extremely useful tool. Magnetic resonance imaging, or MRI, is extensively used to investigate the brain in humans. This technique provides a picture of the brain as a whole, down to a 1 mm resolution. MRI can be used to investigate white matter through tractography. With this technique, neuroanatomists visualize bundles of axons, revealing connections between and within brain areas. In order to assess the correlates between neuroanatomy and disease states, scientists frequently make use of surgical techniques applied to animal models. Stereotactic surgery uses a three-dimensional coordinate system and detailed anatomical atlases to allow researchers to physically manipulate isolated anatomical areas. With a stereotactic apparatus and the appropriate anatomical information, it is possible to deliver electrical stimulation, introduce drugs or other substances, or create lesions in targeted regions of the brain. Thanks for watching! Throughout the course, you may see images from circadian research that has used these techniques. For example, here researchers have used Nissl staining to image the SCN in a coronal slice of a rat brain. As you probably know by now, the SCN is the two dark purple nuclei, right here. And here, researchers use tracers to image projections from the retina directly into the SCN. Finally, here investigators lesioned the SCN to investigate clock function in its absence. So, as you can see, we have a lot of techniques at our disposal to ask interesting questions about important structures, functions, and interactions in the circadian system. That's it for this video on techniques in neurobiology and how they can be used by circadian researchers.